Christina, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes really the, the overall um, report of the five subcommittees. Uh, at this time, we'll open it up for any members who have meeting. Uh, any questions, I'll ask for also for is LAO and finance here. If they want to come forward to the table, that would be helpful so that we'll know they're here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Mr. Jones? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I don't know if the, mm -hmm. if the questions for the sub one chair or for budget staff or, or maybe Department of Finance, but the assembly budget restores $15 million, as uh, Chairman Thurman mentioned, in Medi-Cal optional benefits. And I think the Senate originally proposed and the assembly budget agrees with um, not including chiropractic care. And while they've uh, restored most of the other Medi-Cal funding, I was wondering if uh, somebody could share the rationale for excluding chiropractic when the cost uh, for this year would have only been $257,000. Okay, so anyone from Health and Human Services, Mr. Thurman wants to respond? Yes. Well, the first thing I want to say is that um, overall, I believe that what Sub-1 has done is historic, and we, we couldn't do that without you, Mr. Jones. So let me first thank you <laughs> and Member Grove uh, in her absence and members David Chu and, and Bonta. Uh, and, and the cuts that we've seen in these areas have been devastating. Thank you for really being a part of the solution to help restore those cuts. You bet. Uh, as to um, chiropractic services, um, as you recall from our hearings, we actually have never had any formal discussion about any of the optional benefits. And so I don't know how else to, uh, to answer your question other than, than that. We didn't have any formal discussion of okay. any of the optional benefits. Well, and thank you. And, and, and I recognize that, that it, 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 the Assembly didn't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it was originally proposed by the Senate Budget Committee. And, you know, I just think, I, and I hope that it's just coincidental uh, in that, you know, the Chiropractic Association is the only association that opposed the vaccine bill. Um, you know, so I'm just hoping that the... You know the Senate uh, is being straightforward with their with their budgeting, and I'm hoping that the Assembly, you know, will do our part in the bicameral legislature to make sure that we're defending everybody in those medical uh, restorations. So, um, I, I, I would you. certainly just tag on to what you said. I agree. We don't we don't link policy decisions to who supports or opposes any bill. And what I loved about the way we work together in Sub One this year is that regardless of our political philosophies, we found many occasions to work together in support of the people who depend on health and human services. And to your point, from the standpoint of the Assembly Subcommittee on Health and Human Services, it is, in fact, a coincidence. And, and there's no other rationale other than that. I'm not aware of anything else. I didn't even know until it was mentioned recently. I haven't even read the vaccination bill. And until you and others have said it, I had no idea that those in the chiropractic world opposed it. They provide a great service, you know, from my standpoint, you know, look, I want to spend the whole budget, you know, right? We need to support as many things as we possibly can, and there are many programs that qualify. Sally, chiropractic didn't make it into this one. Let me just simply say also keep in mind that many of these items will find them their way into conference committee, uh, that even though we're, we're um, doing the budget today, uh, all of us have probably been approached by a variety of folks who did not participate in the budget process uh, and want to inclusion in the budget. And so, we, you know, we've taken note of that. Uh, I've taken note of the chiropractic issue. It was not connected to any policy issue on the Senate side. Uh, so I can I know from my, my point of view and others it was not. So we will look at it. We're looking at it. It was may have been an oversight and it may have been intentional. The Senate did exclude it. So obviously it may end up being an item in conference. We will see, uh, as well some as, as well as a number of other issues that have come up. I'm not sure if our finance people have any response to that at all. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Keely Bosler with the Department of Finance. Uh, the optional benefit uh, restoration was part of the Senate and Assembly's plan. It's not part of the governor's budget, so it's not something we support right. at this time. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? The next question, Mr. Williams. Yes, and then I have Mr. Obernold to any. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, this isn't so much a question as a comment on our um, budget as a whole, and uh, particularly the higher education budget. Um, I, I want to say that th this 
work that was done on this budget is is incredible. Uh, I think that budgets are definitely a, a statement of um, values, what we prioritize. And I think looking at this budget as a whole, I I think that the assembly is putting forth a strong statement of our priorities and our values in a positive way for the people of the state. Uh, I think that there are some really good moves in it for higher ed. I want to praise the efforts uh, at um, raising uh, CSU funding for enrollment. Um, that is just key, uh, particularly because uh, the our underrepresented populations in higher ed are overrepresented at the CSU, so that we don't need to do recruitment. We just need to open up more slots, right? Um, uh, that being said, I do think that there is an inaccuracy in the methodology used to calculate what would be necessary to increase enrollment at the UC. Uh, the UC, um, for, for several years, I have been advocating a uh, a additional $100 million because um, I agree with the level of enrollment increase that is asked for in this budget and that the subcommittee um, passed out the 8,000 number or as close to that 8,000 number as we can. However, um, the the fact is that, that the, the legislature uses a placeholder number per student ten thousand dollars per student um, and that's actually not a very accurate figure but even using that placeholder it doesn't uh, take 35 million dollars to raise enrollment by eight thousand it takes 80 million and so to um, to calculate that you're then you're then your your staff is then saying well we're going to get some money from out of um, from out-of-state enrollees, well, if we will get some money from out-of-state enrollees, particularly if you increase that or if you reduce the amount of financial aid they get, but when you make it more expensive for out-of-state enrollees, you can't completely calculate with certainty how much out-of-state enrollees will come in. And so you're, you're you can't bank on enrollment from uncertain numbers because enrollment you're admitting someone um, uh, that you're going to have to pay for for four years, not for one year. Um, and in fact, the 10000 per student is a radically inaccurate number. It actually costs more like $29,000 per student to educate them. And of course, 12000 of that when, when they um, use when they don't use financial aid, twelve thousand of that comes from fees because that's how much you get charged in fees. So it ends up costing the UC about eighteen thousand dollars per student, not ten thousand. By that more accurate methodology, your ba that's about one hundred and forty forty one hundred and forty four million. And so all I'm saying is. There's just not a, a, a mathematical way unless out-of-state um, numbers stay just as high under uh, higher cost to make the enrollment numbers. And the enrollment numbers are incredibly important because that's what we've all said we want. We want more slots for our kids. We want more spaces for the people of California and, and you know, Using the 10,000 figure for your methodology when you're expecting the UC to squeeze out more money um, is, is uh, I think, an indefinite way for anyone to be able to plan for that enrollment increase. And so I do think that that's a, a, a flaw. I just needed to, to, to point that out um, because um, I do think that the courage that the subcommittee showed in embracing the enrollment number is really important and is a statement of the ideals and purpose of uh, this legislature. And uh, because it's so important, uh, I do think that we need to uh, 
back up back up that math. Okay, I, I'm going to encourage members to have questions that are briefer. <laughs> okay, um, so that uh, you know, well, if you'd make a statement tied quickly to a question, um, did you, is there a response that you're asking for for that uh, from the Ed Committee? I don't expect it right now. Whenever okay. they want to. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, I, I know the Ed Committee has spent a lot of time with higher ed, with UC issues, and CSU as well as K-12, and um, th and there's a lot of other pieces that go into it. So we we know that uh, there's an ongoing challenge in funding our universities and getting the response we want in terms of uh, financial responsibility as well as increased enrollment and being fiscally conscious of the resources that they have and a host of other things. Um, uh, so we know that. We also know the issues of numbers is always an issue and that's probably why in the budget there is a funding for a study to be done about the UC issue and the UC needs in the next few years with regards to enrollment because we constantly get these mixed numbers of who was in it and who was rejected and who was not. So there is a plan to for LAO to basically do a study of the academic needs, higher ed needs in the state. So all that will be forthcoming. Mr. Obernolte, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for the Department of Finance. So the governor's budget concluded a conservative revenue projection for 2015-16 of $115 billion in total state revenues. The budget that the Assembly is voting on today uses a more aggressive revenue projection of $117.3 billion. And I have a concern that we're relying on windfall revenues that are one time from things like income tax and capital gains and using those revenues to fund ongoing expenses that might burden us in the future. And uh, the Standard and Poor's bond rating agency agrees and they have said that should we adopt a budget with the more conservative projection that they could then raise the state's bond rating. And I'm wondering how much in future years such a raise in our bond rating would save the state. Um, yes, so uh, the difference between uh, the administration and the LAO's um, estimates, revenue estimates, is about $3 billion. I uh, just want to kind of set the stage about what our May revision um, estimate reflects, because it does reflect a very strong economy here in California, and we've actually um, revised revenue estimates up by $6.7 billion over our January estimates. So the May revision does reflect uh, the, the strength of the economy. Um, and and uh, additional revenues uh, reflected. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, relying on the additional revenues that the LAO projects, I mean, most of that $3 billion difference is in the budget year, uh, and it's related to capital gains and other uh, volatile um, income tax-related revenues. Uh, the uh, administration, uh, the governor, does not want to rely on those additional revenues to build new programs because we're really focused on the next four years. And even under the May revision estimates um, that we have made, uh, we see an uh, operating deficit in 2018-19. And this is related to s several different factors, um, the, the expiration of the Proposition 30 taxes, as well as increased obligations um, that the state has already committed to that ramp up over the next several years. So the out year and the balance over the next four years continues to be precarious. None of this reflects any kind of slowdown or recession in the economy that continues to be a risk. We're already a year past the average length of an economic expansion in the U.S. post-World War II. So that's something we are not projecting at this point in our revenue forecast, but, but it is something that we are, are looking at and are concerned about uh, in terms of uh, building adequate reserves in order to help weather um, um, a downturn in revenues. Uh, in terms of the additional uh, borrowing costs that would uh, result from a downgrade in revenues, that there certainly would be. It would be difficult to quantify that um, right now. I don't have that number for you right now, but it's something that uh, that does affect um, our, uh, our the rate in which um, anybody is able to borrow, um, especially states. Okay, thank you. So the, the it would be interesting to, to know what the actual number is, and the reason why I'm interested in is if, it seems like if we exercise a little restraint and spent 
And rather than spending that $3 billion of windfall revenue this year, we banked it for the future. We could save far more than that in borrowing costs in future years as a result of an improvement in our bond rating. And, and just to restate what I heard you say, and correct me if this is wrong, but I heard you say that you'd recommend that we use the more conservative figure because if we don't, in 2018-19 budget year and thereafter, we have the, uh, the prospects of budget deficits. Is that correct? Yes, our, actually our operating um, reserve in the years before 2018 is also very slim. And there are many factors uh, that could uh, occur. We don't know all of them. Um, it, you know, just one action by the federal government in our Medi-Cal program can change the amount the state has to spend by hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's a lot of uncertainty in addition to the volatility of the revenues um, that we see over the, the forecast period. Right. Thank you that makes much. it a challenge to keep in balance. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Mr. Jones Sawyer. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Mr. Stone, I'm sorry. You do? Yes. <laughs> I thought so. I couldn't tell you guys apart. Confused us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a question. I know we have placeholder language in with respect to the redevelopment agency issue. But where are we headed with that? A number of jurisdictions in my district have grave concerns about what we're doing with, with the RDA. I guess I want to make sure that we're moving in a direction that, that they're going to find helpful. So where, what is it that we're going to be trying to accomplish with that part of our budget? Who's the question for? Um, I'm not, I, really more for the, for the committee. And who's, who's negotiating that with the governor's office? With respect to the redevelopment agencies, redevelopment agencies. and the language that I, I know we have placeholder language, but what, what is it from the assembly standpoint as we move forward with this? What are we trying to accomplish with, with the governor? A lot of jurisdictions have raised serious concerns about what was proposed. I know there's been some movement. There are at least a couple of, of other proposals around about allowing local agencies to be able to hold on to, and especially for affordable housing. And if we can allow flexibility with respect to affordable housing in those jurisdictions, I, I think that would be, be a very helpful dire direction to go into. So I'm just not sure where we're, where we're heading with the RDA language. It's something that, uh, given the first hearing that we had um, uh, and all the issues that came about from the first hearing in February, um, the administration took a step forward and reduced a lot of the concerns. Uh, and, it, of course, that could be argued. Uh, but a, a, a chunk of the concerns uh, by modif taking two modifications. Um, a lot of the cities were still uh, concerned with specific areas that I don't know to what extent we're going to be able to address. Um, uh, on one of the minute issues having to do with the percentage of what's being charged. Uh, I, I, that may be a concern to some of the cities in your district as well at this point. Uh, um, so at this point, I, it was just given the deadlines that we had before us, it was important for us to just move forward and have language that allows for further continuation of the dialogue. But um, I, I don't, to give you an answer, I don't know if anything can actually be taken in a concrete step that's going to appease some of the cities that still have a concern. Right. And why I'm suggesting that we look at things that, that further a state interest, such as affordable housing and making sure that local jurisdictions are able to continue to spend their bond proceeds on, on affordable housing. I just want to put that on the table and register that concern, and, and I'm happy to talk to you sure. offline. Sure. Uh, my understanding is that, and, and Mr. Nazarian I think has addressed most of it, is that the, there's a number of issues that are still on the table. Uh, this placeholder language allows the conversation to go forward in the brief time frame that they had to deal with it. Uh, there still are issues, as he pointed out, with regards to the loans, the local agency investment funds, 
uh, and the housing issue is still there, and, and there's some language for that that's in there. There are a multitude of moving parts in that area. Uh, we know our speaker is very concerned about that area, and so that's obviously pieces that will go to conference as well as with the governor. Um, hopefully you'll weigh in on some of that and have an in, in, impact on it as well. Okay, but it is placeholder language because of the complexity of the issues that have, have been circulating for years around redevelopment. Mm -hmm. And so we're conscious of it. We know the locals still have a lot of issues, a lot of resources out there, a lot of needs in terms of particularly in the area of housing. And so we are conscious of that as well as we know the governor has a, a very special interest in redevelopment in terms of it. So we have to work those pieces out collaboratively. Okay. Um, Mr. Cooper. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, yes, my question is for uh, Budget Sub 5 regarding the city law enforcement grants for 40 let, million. Let me, uh, oh. let me clarify. You, you have the uh, errata sheet that changes the recommendation. Uh, page 183 deals with the grants. Yes. So hopefully everyone has access to that. I just want to make sure you were talking from the current sure. information. And, and, no and problem. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Chair. And originally it was it was changed to 20 million. Now it's back up to 40 million. And I've got several phone calls from my local chiefs, and that money they were using here in Sacramento County was for realignment. Now we know the governor and this body have a lot invested in realignment and wanted to succeed, and that's so important. Even though it's still 40 million. 20 million is being used for other purposes, obviously for the uh, to report on uh, use of force reports issues and 5 million for body cameras. So effectively the 40 million is still there, but it's been cut in half. So they, ha they do have some concerns with some of my local agencies and I'm sure other members, their PDs are using it to monitor realignment. So that is still an issue. 5 million statewide for body cameras. Um, I support body cameras. $5 million statewide is a drop in the bucket. It's, 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 it's pennies on that. And then for the uh, use of force data, I think it's a great tool. It, it should be out there for transparency in the public's resources. Uh, the only issue is there's no, um, there's no specific reporting requirement and, and no template for it. So I think we've got to go back and do that, and that'd be great. But let's, because right now the way agencies um, obtain their data is very different from agency to agency. So you do need a template for that. And I think all agencies should do that. But Tying it to the realignment, and realignment is so important right now because parole's been cut, so it's left to those local police departments to make sure these folks are doing what they need to be doing and, and getting them support and help. So we effectively have cut that in half. So that's just some of my concerns with that. Okay, that, that comment should go to the committee chair uh, because that's, that's sub five. LAO's recommendation was to eliminate it completely. Uh, the chair has, um, keeping in mind that this was a one-time allocation of about 10 million, I think, during an economic crisis. So LAO's position was to completely eliminate it because we're no longer in a crisis and the resources at the local levels are higher now than they were when this, uh, when this proposal went in initially as 10 million. Now it's up to 40. Uh, the Senate has eliminated it completely based on LAO's recommendation. Our staff is phasing out it, I guess, uh, but Mr. Jones Sawyer can uh, discuss that. And, and yeah, <clears throat> and, and just so you know, um, we heard from the chiefs and, and part of the, 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 the challenge that both the Senate and I will also say the Assembly has, um, when asked how are these resources being used to help with the 109 and, and most importantly as we go into Prop 47, um, we really didn't get any definitive answers um, from law enforcement on that. Um, but, saying, but just going with that, um, the Senate totally eliminated it. The governor's office um, want to give them 40 million. Um, the, the question is whether or not we have some type of accountability, um, whether or not these strings are unattached. Um, after listening to uh, Mr. Cooper and, and members from my committee, uh, I felt it prudent to strike some kind of compromise. And so there is $20 million that has absolutely no strings on it. It's still problematical for, for me and, and, and several members of both the Senate and the Assembly on how it's being spent. Um, and so what you see from the Senate, they're actually putting in what they think the money should be spent on uh, specifically. Um, at least when it goes to conference committee, and this is what I would suggest to the um, police chiefs, that you, you make very transparent what these monies are being spent on and, and how it actually will help with um, the 109s and the realignment. 
um, because I think that's what is needed when it gets to conference. Right now, um, if you want to look at it, um, I, I guess the police chiefs looks at it as half empty. I look at it as half full. And so depending on your perspective, um, the assembly is probably taking, taking the high road and is looking at it, starting to phase it to where it can actually be used for 109s. And if they can come back um, as we go to conference um, and make a good compelling case for how this money is specifically being used to help with the 109s, I think once it gets to conference, um, you, you may get a better result than definitely on the Senate side. Well, and I appreciate you guys uh, putting that money back in, and I will looking forward to working with you on that. Mr. Rodriguez. I also had, had a comment. First of all, I want to thank uh, all the committee chairs and uh, you, Ms. Weber, as well, for bringing this uh, report to us today. And also wanted to thank uh, Assemblyman General Sawyer for looking to improve uh, some of that funding back to the local levels, uh, because I've also heard from four of my police chiefs at the local level, how this funding is very important for what they use in various purposes to really enforce the law and fight crime at the local level. So I know it's, uh, it's $20 million, um, versus nothing, and it's a right step in the right direction as we continue to listen to our local level police chiefs on the issues they um, face every day and how this funding can be really useful for them to uh, fight some of the purposes they do in the local level. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure if L.A. or... Finance wanted to respond to any of it at all. Um, I'll, I would, Keely Bosler with Department of Finance, I would just add that uh, the May revision does include a, a $40 million um, for frontline law enforcement. Uh, this is a continuation of the same same funding level that was provided last year. I would also just note that uh, today uh, a, a letter was signed uh, to the controller to repay uh, local government cities and counties um, $765 million in um, uh, monies that were owed uh, for back pay uh, on mandates. Uh, so that is additional money that will go to city budgets uh, and county budgets um, to help support um, base level services. Um, also the, the dissolute, tying it back to the last subject we just discussed is the dissolution of redevelopment has also provided an additional $4.2 billion in general a purpose property tax revenues that have been returned to cities and counties also to support uh, ongoing uh, uh, base services like police and fire. Drew Soderborg, Legislative Analyst Office. The only thing I would add is with respect to our office's recommendation, originally the uh, city police grants were billed as a way to help uh, the police address cuts made as part of the uh, recession that we experienced earlier in the part of this decade. Um, when we took a look at uh, local uh, revenues, they've appeared to have recovered to pre-recession levels. We would note that there, is, there has... Uh, uh, been sort of a stall in hiring police officers, so we don't have as many police officers uh, out in the communities as we did prior to uh, the recession. However, that seems to reflect more of a local <coughs> reprioritization of funds rather than a need for additional state funding. And on that basis, we uh, recommended not uh, approving the, the grants. Madam Chair, the, the one thing I would say is that before parole was cut significantly, so those cuts that happened with parole are still in effect. So the number of parole officers that were out there making sure these folks succeed and also comply at the same time have never been risen up to the same level. So in effect, those city police officers are doing that job. So it, it's a wash, basically. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, question to LAO and finance. Um, just to the last statement from LAO about the reprioritization from local cities, I'm not sure that's the case for all police departments, and I'll just use the city of Oakland as an example. As you probably know, um, they're significantly understaffed for their population and don't have the dollars to do it. So it's, uh, it is still a funding issue and a need for funding. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I do think that there's an opportunity here, in addition to the $40 million, to look at ways to support departments locally. But I want to ask a different question to finance. Um, um, Ms. Bossler, I wanted to ask you about um, in the May Revise, what's in the May Revise for this particular program? And that is cameras for police cars, in-car in camera functions. What, what is in the May Revise for that? 
Uh, we do not have any proposals related to uh, cam uh, uh, law enforcement cameras in our in our May revision. Madam Chair, if I could ask the sub chair, if this is something of, of this committee, um, public safety, if this is something that came up in conversation uh, about, in addition to everything else, equipping cars with um, cameras, in-car cameras, uh, to the chair, if anything came up, Mr. Jones Sawyer. Um, the, the only discussion we had about um, cameras in cars was based on body cameras, being able to coordinate the two. Um, right now, there are a lot of departments that already have um, implemented some type of uh, cameras within their vehicles. And so then the next question comes, begs the question of how do you coordinate a body camera with the car? And that's, you know, that's one of the things that the CHP will be looking at. For example, all CHP officers' cars have um, some type of camera recording device. Once an officer is out, how do we then connect that so you get a panoramic view of what's going on? Um, but we did not receive any requests. Um, we didn't, no department came to us to say, look, we, we also need to put more cameras on our vehicles. Um, that wasn't anything that was, um, was requested by any uh, law enforcement or even, even the public. Uh, it was specifically about body cameras. Okay, I don't see any other requests for questions. Um, uh, that having been said, I want to thank uh, LAO and Department of Finance for being here um, and, and fielding any questions that were related to you. I want to remind our members that uh, we're dealing with the budget that we're proposing, so uh, they've given us some financial forecasts, but oftentimes the specific details of what to fund and not to fund rest in the subcommittees and the recommendation that will go forward from the subcommittees uh, that are now on our desk for us to uh, basically respond to. I uh, want to remind us, this is you, we're going to get a lot of comments and questions over the next few days about this budget, and um, I'm hoping that many of you will refer back to the sub-chairs because it's been a very detailed and very extensive process that they've gone through, and there will always be a little bit of something somewhere that somebody else wanted. Uh, we have to recognize also that there's almost a zero-sum game, that when you basically take something out you, uh, or put something in, you need to take something out. Uh, because it's not a, a never-ending situation where you just keep adding programs and adding and adding as a never-ending budget. So always keep that in mind that there were some decisions made at the subcommittee level that impacted how the, what, what was recommended. And there are a number of wonderful things that we could have funded that are not in this budget. Um, as I said to the committee last year, as we were talking about many of the issues, we want to make sure that people know we're beginning to address the issues. We obviously are not addressing every issue in this budget. We want to be sensitive to the fact that the Calvary is coming. We hope to get to those areas that we left out, and many of those are found this year in this budget that we couldn't do last year, like issues of Medi-Cal and what have you. So we're slowly working on these issues that are very, very important to us. We will be going into conference on this budget. We know that everything in this budget we will not get. That is generally what happens. But, uh, but we're going to work to make sure that the values that we've identified at the beginning are responded to in the conference committee and hopefully in our negotiation with the governor as we work to get the budget passed and to reflect the agenda and the items that we think are important. So I just want to remind our members of that, that as we move forward in our, with our own memberships and our caucuses, as we go forward, that this is, this is the result of 70 different meetings, lots of hours of hearings uh, that many folks have engaged in and a lot of conversation and a lot of public comments doesn't address every issue. We think we've addressed a lot of issues, but every issue is not found in this budget. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here today for their participation. At this time, I'd like a motion to be able to adopt the budget. So moved. It's been moved and second to adopt this package that's before us today. Roll call. Weber. Aye. Melendez. No. Allen. Bigelow. No. Bonta. Chavez. Chu? Aye. Cooley? Aye. Cooper? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Grove? Jones? No. Jones Sawyer? Aye. Kim? No. Lackey? McCarty? Aye. Lackey's Mullen? no, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Mullen? Aye. Nazarian? Aye. Obernolte? No. Yes. O'Donnell? Aye. Patterson? No. Rodriguez? Aye. Stone? Aye. Thurman? Ting? Aye. Wilk? No. Williams? 
Alan. Oh, he came. Um, eyes 14. Thank you. Eyes 15, 8, nose 8, Metro passes. Okay. The um, motion passes, so the adoption of the budget has been done. I want to thank our, uh, our assembly members, our TV folks who are obviously recording us, thank the sergeants who are here, thank finance and LAO, and all of the budget staff, a tremendous staff of consultants and who work with us. I want to thank them all for being here. This meeting is adjourned.